Prime Minister Absol Khan. Question number one. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, the post office IT scandal is one of the greatest miscarriages of justice in our nation's history, and I'm determined that the victims get the justice and redress that they deserve. Today, we're introducing legislation to quash convictions resulting from this scandal. The Department for Business and Trade will be responsible for the new redress scheme, and we're widening access to the optional £75,000 payment. Hundreds of innocent sub-postmasters have fought long and hard for justice. With this bill, we will deliver it. Meetings of ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Speaker, despite serious opposition from the Archbishop of Canterbury, three former Home Secretaries and three Government Ministers' advisers on anti-Semitism, social cohesion and on political violence, the levelling up sector is due to widen the definition of extremism tomorrow. Whilst on the benches opposite, members peddle far-right conspiracy theories about Islamists and Muslims taking over Britain. Shouldn't the Prime Minister's priority be getting his own house in order and stepping out extremism, racism and Islamophobia from within his Conservative Party? And will the Prime Minister finally take Islamophobia seriously and agree to the definition? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, discrimination has no place in our society. And it's important, to distinguish, it's important to distinguish between strongly felt political debate on one hand and unacceptable acts of abuse, intimidation and violence on the other. I would urge him to wait for the details of the strategy. It's a sensitive matter, but it's one that we must tackle because there has been a rise in extremists who are trying to hijack our democracy. That must be confronted. And he talks about peddling conspiracy theories. I would just point him in the direction of his previous Labour candidate in Rochdale. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Armed forces personnel who serve their country for 15, uh, 15 years are eligible for the Long Service Good Conduct Medal, and similar medals are in place for those who make a career of serving in the police, the fire, the ambulance service, and the Coast Guard. But as I learnt on a recent visit to Bournemouth Hospital, where I met the dedicated staff there, no such accolade is in place for the NHS. Would the Prime Minister please support my campaign to see if this anomaly can be corrected, so the nation can formally recognise those who devote much of their working lives in the NHS to helping others. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. My uh, right honourable friend is right that our incredible NHS staff deserve our utmost thanks for their service. And I'm pleased that many NHS organisations, as he knows, have their own schemes in place to do that. We also, of course, recognise NHS staff who are outstanding through our honours system, and MPs are able to acknowledge their work through the NHS Parliamentary Awards, and nominations remain open for that, and I would encourage colleagues uh, to avail themselves of it. But I will make sure that he gets to meet the Secretary of State to discuss his specific proposals further. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome the legislation on the Post Office scandal? Mr Speaker, this week we lost the formidable Tommy McAvoy. He served his hometown of Rutherglen and the Labour government with loyalty and good humour, and we send our deepest sympathies to his wife, Eleanor, and their family. We also learned that the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead will be taking her well-deserved retirement. She has served this House and her constituents with a real sense of duty, and her unwavering commitment to ending modern slavery is commended by all of us. We thank her for her service. Is the Prime Minister proud to be bankrolled by someone using racist and misogynist language when he says the member for Hackney North and Stoke Newington makes you want to hate all black women? Minister. Mr Speaker, the alleged comments were wrong, they were racist, and he has now, as I said, the comments were wrong, they were racist. He has rightly apologised for them, and that remorse, and that remorse should be accepted, Mr Speaker. There is no place for racism in Britain, and the government that I lead is living proof of that. Mr Speaker, the man bankrolling the Prime Minister also said that the member for Hackney North 
should be shot? How low would he have to sink? What racist, woman-hating threat of violence would he have to make before the Prime Minister plucked up the courage to hand back the £10 million that he's taken from him? Mr Speaker, as I said, the gentleman apologised genuinely for his comments, and that remorse should be accepted. But he talks about language. He, he might want to reflect on the double standards of his deputy leader, of his deputy leader calling her opponent scum, Mr. Speaker. His shadow, his shadow, fo- his shadow foreign secretary, the shadow foreign secretary, comparing conservatives to Nazis, Mr. Speaker, and the man that he wanted to make chancellor. The man that he wanted to make Chancellor talking about lynching a female minister. His silence on that speaks volumes. Mr Speaker, the difference is he's scared of his party. I've changed my party. I want you both the Prime Minister and leave the opposition. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister invited himself into everyone's living room at six o'clock on a Friday evening. No one asked him to give that speech. He chose to do it. He chose to anoint himself as the great healer and pose as some kind of unifier. But when the man bankrolling his election says the member for Hackney North should be shot, He suddenly finds himself tongue-tied, shrinking in sophistry, hoping he can deflect for long enough that we'll all go away. What does the Prime Minister think it was about the hundreds of millions of pounds of NHS contracts given to Frank Hester by his government that first attracted him to giving £10 million to the Tory party in the first place? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I'm absolutely not going to take any lectures from somebody... I'm somebody, I'm somebody who chose to represent an anti-Semitic terrorist group, Hizbut Tahrir, who chose to serve a leader who let anti-Semitism run rife in this Labour Party. Those are his actions, those are his values, and that's how he should be judged. Mr Speaker, the problem is he's describing a Labour Party that no longer exists. I'm describing, I'm describing the man who is bankrolling that up in general election. Um, oh. Here's Tom. They, they can shout all they like. Two weeks ago, he marched them out like fools to defend Islamophobia, and now the member for Ashfield is warming up the opposition benches for them. And yesterday, yesterday, he sent them out to play down racism and misogyny until he was forced to change course. He won't hand the money back. He won't comment on how convenient it is that a man handed huge NHS contracts by his government is now his party's biggest donor. You have to wonder what the point is of a Prime Minister who can't lead and a party that can't govern. And Mr Speaker, national insurance contributions fund state pensions and the NHS. So is the Prime Minister's latest unfunded £46 billion promise to scrap national insurance going to be paid for by cuts to state pensions or cuts to the NHS? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, it's, I'm glad he's brought up the budget. It's about time that he spoke about his plans. Because what have we heard, Mr. Speaker, from the Shadow Chief Secretary, the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, confirm? Sure. Shh, Prime Minister. <laughs> the Shadow Chief Secretary of the Treasury has confirmed that the Labour Party will not be sticking to the Conservative government spending plans. So we now have a litany. A litany of unfunded promises on the NHS, on mental health, on dentistry, on breakfast clubs, and that doesn't even include the £28 billion 2030 eco pledge that he's still committed to. But what we all know, Mr. Speaker, is that while we're cutting taxes, Labour's unfunded promises mean higher taxes for working Britain. No, Mr Speaker, the Labour Party will not be sticking to his completely unfunded £46 billion promise. But he thinks he can, he can trick people into believing that, but simply shaking the Tory magic money tree will bring it into existence. No, no, let, let, 
let's be clear, 80 per cent of national insurance is spent on social security and pensions, 20 per cent is spent on the NHS. So he's either cutting pensions or the NHS, or he will have to raise other taxes or borrowing. Which is it, Prime Minister? Mr Speaker, I know, I know it's not a strong point, but if you actually listened to the Chancellor last week, what he would have seen is NHS spending is going up, Mr Speaker. It's going up. It's a plan that's backed by the NHS CEO, who says that we're giving her what she needs, and at the same time, we are responsibly cutting taxes for millions of people in work. An average worker benefiting from a £900 tax cut, Mr Speaker, but what I'm hearing from him is he's against our plans to cut national insurance. The highest tax burden since the Second World War. I did listen to the Chancellor. £46 billion of unfunded commitments. They tried that under the last administration, and everybody else is paying the price. And two weeks ago, the Prime Minister promised to crack down on those spreading hate. Today, he shrunk at the first challenge. Last week, he promised fantasy tax cuts. Now he's pretending it can all be paid for with no impact on pensions or the NHS. All we need now, Mr Speaker, is an especially hardy lettuce, and it could be 2022 (laughs) all over again. Is it any wonder that he's too scared to call an election when the public can see that the only way to protect their country, their pension and their NHS from the madness of this Tory party is by voting Labour? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, again... No, Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, he talks about pensions. Pensions are going up by around £900 in this year. It's this government that's protected the triple lock for the last 10 years. He talks about supporting working people. It's this government that's cutting taxes for every single person in work, Mr Speaker. It's this government that's investing in the NHS. But all we have from him are all we have from him is a £28 billion unfunded promise. Mr Speaker, I had a look at it. I had a look at it. It's here. It's all here. Making Britain a clean energy superpower. He's still stuck to it, Mr Speaker. And if you look through it carefully, there's billions in spending he's already committed to Scotland, billions for Wales. There's actually money for North London too, I notice. But the problem is, the problem is... The problem is, none of it is funded. So why doesn't he come clean and tell him under his plans, Britain people's taxes are going up, Mr Speaker? Richard Graham. Mr Speaker, millions of people around the UK and Europe have been inspired by the brilliance of Six Nations rugby. And Premier League clubs like Gloucester Rugby, which were funded during the pandemic through loans authorised by the Prime Minister as then Chancellor, have always been grateful for being kept solvent. But the Prime Minister will also know that the finances of some of these clubs are fragile and that the current loan repayment schemes could be crippling. So will my right hon. Friend ask the Sports Minister and the Treasury to try and find a solution through this so that taxpayer interests are protected and all of us can go on being inspired by top-class rugby for years to come? Mr Minister. Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we stepped in with a £150 million financial lifeline to ensure the survival of Premiership Rugby League clubs during the pandemic. And I am told that DCMS is working with Sport England as the agent to talk to borrowers with concerns about their loan agreements and any ones that do have concerns should contact Sport England in the normal way. But I can also proudly tell him that we are talking to the Rugby Football Union and the Premiership League to secure not just the future of Rugby Union, but also his local Gloucester Rugby. Yeah. We come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen Flynn. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I wish to begin by wishing Ramadan Mubarak to Muslims across these aisles. Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party have accepted a £10 million donation from an individual who has said that one of our parliamentary colleagues in this chamber should be shot. Why is the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom putting money before morals? Mr Speaker, as I said, the comments were wrong. The gentleman in question has apologised for them, and that remorse should be accepted.
Stephen Flynn. This is complete rubbish. The gentleman in question apologised for being rude. He wasn't rude. He was racist. He was odious. And he was downright bloody dangerous. Yep. Now, on Monday, the number 10 said, we've seen an unacceptable rise in extremist activity, which is seeking to divide our society and hijack our democratic institutions. Isn't the extremism that we should all be worried about? The, the views of those Tory donors that we've read about this week. Yeah. Prime Minister. No, Mr Speaker, there has actually been a rise in extremist activity that is seeking to hijack our democratic institutions. It's important, it is important, it is important that we have the tools to tackle this threat. That's what the extremism strategy will do, and I would urge him to wait for the community secretary to release the details. Well, Gwens. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sub-postmasters across the country will welcome the government's announcement today on the introduction of legislation to overturn the convictions of those who were wrongly convicted. But can my right honourable friend reassure this House that that legislation will be passed as quickly as possible, and we will support all sub-postmasters right across our United Kingdom? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, as I said, I want to pay tribute to all postmasters who have campaigned tirelessly for justice, including those who tragically won't see the justice that they deserve. Today's legislation marks an important step in finally clearing their names, and across this House we owe it to them to progress this legislation as soon as possible before summer recess so that we can deliver the justice that they have fought for. We are continuing to work with our counterparts in Scotland and Northern Ireland as they develop their plans, but regardless of where and how convictions are quashed, redress will be paid to victims across the whole of our United Kingdom on exactly the same basis. Ed Dick. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The future of children's cancer services... Ed David. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the future of children's cancer services in my constituency, across South West London, across Surrey, Sussex, and beyond, will be decided by NHS England tomorrow. The existing service is world leading and has saved the lives of countless children. Many of us who have engaged with the consultation process feel that a wrong decision is about to be made, ignoring risk to children's cancer care by moving them to the Evelina. If the Evelina is chosen tomorrow, will the Prime Minister personally intervene and delay any final decision until he's met with myself and concerned, concerned MPs across the House so he can prevent these risks to our children's cancer services? Minister. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman, right, gentleman knows, uh, decisions about clinical provision are rightly made by clinicians in local areas across the country. Uh, more generally, we are investing in more oncologists, radiologists and community diagnostic centres, which are contributing to cancer treatment being at record levels. But I will, of course, ensure that he and colleagues uh, get a meeting with the Secretary of State. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Radical Islamists pose a serious threat to our nation's security, yeah. and I agree with my right honourable friend that we must urgently address this. But reports that the government wishes to broaden the definition of extremism are concerning because in separating the definition of extremism from actual violence and harm, we may criminalise people with a wide range of legitimate views and have a chilling effect on free speech. So can my right honourable friend reassure me that instead of trying to police people's thought and speech, as those opposite clearly wish to do, the government will instead target the specific groups that foster terrorism and those who fund them? Prime Minister. My uh, moral friend makes a good point, and that is why uh, the strategy that I would urge her to wait for will, I think, be one that she can support, because it is our duty to make sure the government has the tools to tackle the threat that she rightly identifies and highlights. And This is absolutely not about silencing those with private and peaceful <laughs> beliefs, nor will it impact free speech, which we on this side of the House will always strive to protect. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Children deserve the right to breathe clean air. Yes. However, many schools are in areas with high levels of air pollution. Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has announced... Keep going, Janet. 
Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, has announced a pilot for 200 of London's most impacted schools to access air quality filters so children can breathe clean air Excellent. in their classrooms. Excellent. Does the Prime Minister support this pilot and will he implement similar measures across our country? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I am pleased that latest published figures show that air pollution has reduced significantly since 2010, and partly due to our targets, partly due to our legally binding targets to reduce concentrations, they will continue to reduce over the following years. And on top of that, we've also provided almost a billion pounds to help local authorities across the country implement local plans to reduce NO2 and make sure that we can support those impacted by those plans. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand the latest scheme that has been considered is to pay migrants thousands of pounds to leave Britain. Prime Minister, let's just leave the ECHR and deport them for free. So far, over 40,000 Brits have signed my petition with the Conservative Post calling for us to leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Will the Prime Minister commit to leaving the ECHR, or at the very least, have it in our manifesto to have a referendum and let Britain decide? Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is absolutely right that we must do everything we can to secure our borders, ensure that those who come here illegally do not have the ability to stay. That is why our Rwanda scheme and legislation is so important. And What I have said repeatedly and will happily say to her again is that I will not let a foreign court block our ability to send people to Rwanda when the time comes. Do you have to about the National Theatre <coughs> production, Nye, which stars Michael Sheen, celebrates at the end a transformational increase in life expectancy since the founding of the NHS. But UCL findings indicate that austerity policies between 2010 and 2019 are responsible for a three-year setback in life expectancy progress. Does he, or the Leader of the Opposition for that matter, think public services can withstand an extra £20 billion pounds of cuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Mr. M Mr Speaker, first of all, I'm pleased that the National Theatre have received significant funding from the Chancellor in the recent budget to support their fantastic work across the UK. But I, I am surprised to hear her raising the NHS when it's her party that's propping up the Welsh Labour government yeah. in Wales, which has absolutely the worst NHS performance of any part of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Mr Speaker, may I thank my right honourable friend for meeting me six weeks ago to discuss the plight of victims of COVID-19 vaccine damage. And may I ask him, following that discussion and his very sympathetic response during the GB People's Forum to Mr John Watt, who himself is a victim of COVID-19 vaccine damage, whether the government will be supporting my COVID-19 vaccine payments bill this Friday. Well, Mr Speaker, can I thank my honourable friend for raising the issue and the conversation that I had with him previously and extend my sympathies to all of those who have been affected by this. I, I will, of course, make sure that he can meet with the Secretary of State to discuss his bill. And As I committed to him, we are looking at the issue in some detail to make sure that the policies we have got are providing the support that they need to. Speaker. The Prime Minister stood outside Downing Street saying that he wanted to root out hate and extremism. Can you imagine? Yet it shamefully took him more than 24 hours Shame. to finally say the remarks Shame. by the Tories' biggest donor that looking at the right honourable member for Hackney North and Stoke New Newington makes you want to hate all Shame. black women were indeed racist. Yep. In November, the Prime Minister accepted a non-cash donation to the tune of £15,000 from Frank Hester for the use of his helicopter. Mm. So will he reimburse him, yes or no? <coughs> no, no, Mr Speaker. And I'm pleased that, I, I'm pleased that, I'm pleased that the gentleman is supporting a party that represents one of the most diverse governments in this country's history, led by this country's first British Asian Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, later today, I look forward to voting for a tax cut for yeah. thousands of my constituents.
constituents a national insurance tax cut that will mean £900 off the tax bill for thousands of my constituents. After listening to the rhetoric from the Leader of the Opposition today, does the Prime Minister expect that the main opposition party will vote against this afternoon's tax cuts? Ah. 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 Well, my right honourable right friend raises an excellent question, because whilst on this side of the House we believe in a country where hard work is rewarded and people can keep more of their hard-earned money, which is why we're cutting their taxes by an average of £900 each, we hear consistently from the party opposite not only do they disagree with that approach, they continue to cling to unfunded spending promises that will put taxes up, but also the Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, we learnt just yesterday, described our plan to end the double taxation on work as morally abhorrent. And that is the contrast between us and them. Labour will put your taxes up and the Conservatives will keep cutting them. Thank you, but, <coughs> thank you, Mr Speaker. Many of us backbenchers, and now it seems the Prime Minister himself, have taken to referring to the European Court of Human Rights as a foreign court, as if there's something inherently wrong with things being foreign or people being right, foreign. Exactly. In what way can a court that the UK has belonged to since 1953, which has an Irish president and a UK justice with an LLB from Dundee, be considered foreign? I think the House needs to hear the Prime Minister commit today to the UK's continued membership of a court and a convention which has protected our rights and freedoms for over 70 years. Yeah. Yeah. So, Mr Speaker, when it comes to the issue of tackling illegal migration, when Parliament expresses a clear view on what it believes should happen, supports that with legislation, and that we believe we are acting in accordance with all our international obligations, I have been very clear that I will not let a foreign court stop us from sending illegal migrants to Rwanda. That is the right policy and, in fact, the only way to ensure security of our borders and end the unfairness of illegal migration. As a general election is not just a mere expression of opinion but a serious choice, will my right of all friend agree that there is only one potential party of government that has the will, the inclination and the determination to stop mass illegal and legal migration, and that is the Conservative Party. Let's unite our movement to do that. I agree, agree with my honourable friend entirely. I agree with my honourable friend entirely. And we know this because not only has the Ronald gentleman opposite opposed the scheme, he's been clear that even when the scheme is implemented and working, he would still scrap it, Mr Speaker, which tells you everything you need to know. On this issue, their values are simply not those of the British people. There's only one party that's going to stop the boats. It's the Conservative Party. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Under this Conservative Government's watch, Thames Water have dumped over 72 billion litres of sewage into London's rivers, all whilst racking up multi-billion pound debts, and reports are now that they could go bust any day. Despite this, the Government is still refusing to publish their contingency plans for the collapse of our country's biggest water firm. So, yes or no, does the Prime Minister believe that Thames Water will still exist by the end of the year. Prime Minister. Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on individual companies, but what I can say is that our ambitious storm overflow reduction plan is backed by £60 billion of capital investment. We now monitor every single storm overflow across England and have legislated to introduce unlimited penalties on water companies that breach their obligations. The independent regulator and the environment agency have the powers they need to hold water companies, wherever they are, to account. Natalie Elphi. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, later this year, a new digital EU border system will come in, and yet key di changes that are required, key details, have still not been decided by the EU. There are urgent decisions that are needed on additional funding and preparation to keep Dover clear and Kent moving through with its traffic. Can my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, assure me that this issue is being taken seriously at the highest levels of government and that funding and support will be made available to keep Dover clear, support the residents of Dover and Deal and Kent, and to secure our vital cross-channel trade and tourism? Prime Minister. 
No, my uh, honourable friend is right to raise this issue, and I can assure her that it is being discussed at the highest levels of government between UK ministers and EU and French counterparts to make sure that we have practical and constructive solutions that will ease the flow of traffic in the way that she describes and will benefit her local communities. Rachel McCaskill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 158 days, and there is no peace and no justice. There was no food, there was no clean water, there was no sanitation and no medical aid. There are just no words left as disease is spreading and the death toll is rising, not least amongst children, victims of these atrocities. It is evident that the Prime Minister's plan is not working. So will he change track for the sake of these children and so many more and work to secure a bilateral immediate ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. Prime Minister. (laughs) Mr Speaker, I've said repeatedly that we are incredibly concerned about the growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Too many civilians have lost their lives and nowhere near enough aid is getting through. And in contrast to what the Honourable Lady said, actually the UK is playing a leading role in alleviating that suffering, just recently increasing the amount of aid this year to £100 million. Just today, 150 tonnes of UK aid is due to arrive in Gaza, and a full field hospital flown from Manchester to the Middle East last week will also arrive in Gaza in the coming days, staffed by UK and local medics to provide life-saving care. We are doing absolutely everything we can, working with our allies, to bring much-needed aid to the people of Gaza. Show them report. Mr Speaker, will my right honourable friend join me in thanking the maternity team at the Royal Cornwall Hospital at Trelisk in my Drew and Falmouth constituency for all their outstanding work they've done to improve maternity (laughs) services over the last few years? Their sheer hard work, along with the coming new Women and Children's Hospital, mean that there are now no midwifery vacancies in Cornwall, which I think you'll agree is a fantastic achievement. Well, can I thank my uh, honourable friend for highlighting the improvement in maternity services at the Royal Cornwall? And she, in particular, is a tireless campaigner for reducing baby loss, and I commend her for her recent work on the introduction of baby loss certificates. And as she knows, we are committed to a new women and children's hospital for my honourable friend's local trust in 2030 as part of the new hospital programme. Sir Dyke. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents in Somerton and Froome, working together with the Langport Transport Group, submitted a robust strategic business case to the Government in July 2022 for the reopening of a train station in the Somerton and Langport area, a train station that would connect over 50,000 people to the rail network, boost the local economy and support local people to reduce their reliance on their cars. Almost two years on, they are still waiting for a response. So does the Prime Minister support this project and can he provide confidence to my constituents that their hard work to drive this vital project forward has not been futile? Prime Minister. Uh, well, Mr. Mr Speaker, Conservatives in the South West are rightly championing the reopen of local stations and actually recently Columpton and Wellington will be one of the places that receives funding as a result of our decision on HS2. But it's because of that decision that we now have freed up billions of pounds of funding to invest in local transport across the country, and it will be local leaders that will be put in charge of that many to prioritise their local needs. Final question, Mark Francois. Prime Minister, in the 1930s, One of your less illustrious predecessors, Neville Chamberlain, so denuded the British Armed Forces of funding until it was too late that we failed to deter Adolf Hitler and 50 million people tragically died in the Second World War. Russia has invaded Ukraine. China is threatening Taiwan. British shipping is being attacked by Houthis in the Red Sea. As the son of a D-Day veteran, could you please assure me and the House of Commons we are not going to forget the lessons of history and make the same mistake again? Prime Minister. Well, can I thank my honourable friend for his tireless campaigning for our armed forces? And he's right to champion them and the role that they play. And I agree with him wholeheartedly that, sadly, the world that we are living in 
is becoming both more challenging strategically and more dangerous. And in response to those challenges, we must invest more in our armed forces. That is exactly what we are doing with the largest uplift since the Cold War and recently topped up with billions of pounds to strengthen our nuclear enterprise and rebuild stockpiles. He rightly mentioned the threat posed by the Houthis and Russia and Ukraine, and I know that he will be proud of the role that the United Kingdom is playing in both of those situations. We are respected and valued by our allies, but most importantly, we on this side of the House will do whatever it takes to keep our country safe. That completes Prime Minister's questions.